This video provides a quick overview of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and how it affects Wisconsin. My name is Jennifer Camrud and I'm a Policy Initiatives Advisor at the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act is also known as the Every Student Succeeds Act. The original legislation was signed into law in 1968 by President Johnson as a civil rights piece of legislation. Most recently, it was reauthorized as ESSA, or the Every Student Succeeds Act. So what's in ESSA? ESSA has a number of titles. The titles that tend to get the most attention are Title I, which is intended to provide all children with an opportunity to receive a fair, equitable, and high-quality education and to close the educational achievement gaps. Title II is meant to provide additional grants to focus on improving the number, quality, and effectiveness of educators. And Title III covers English language instruction. Title IV is meant to improve student academic achievement by providing some basic grants and funding for community learning centers. The law contains a number of provisions that states are required to do and local districts require to implement. The top 10 things that states are required to do in terms of things we get asked about and things that people tend to pay a lot of attention to in the law are as follows. One, states must have challenging academic standards. Two, they must test all students in grades three through eight in English, language arts, math, and once in high school in those same subjects. Three, they have to test students once in elementary, middle, and high school in science. Four, uh, we have to identify the lowest performing schools and schools with low performing subgroups of students. Five, approve school improvement plans for the lowest performing schools. Six, disaggregate student performance data by subgroups. Seven, provide supports to students who are English learners, migratory, homeless, and delinquent, neglected, or at risk. Eight, report school level financial data. Nine, look at the distribution of teachers in front of different student populations. And 10, submit a state plan, which we have done, identifying state goals and a timeline for improving education. So what is in our state plan? In terms of accountability, our long-term goal is to cut achievement gaps in half within six years. In particular, we are focused, as required under the law, on English language arts, math, and graduation rates. And we've set goals by subgroup, so we're looking at race, disability, English learner status, and economic status, seeing where people are today, and then setting a target goal for each subgroup so that we can accomplish that long-term goal. In terms of what we're looking at in accountability, we have a number of performance indicators that are required under the law, and we've addressed all of those in our state plan. So we're looking at academic achievement, in other words, how you do on the state test related to English language arts and math, progress towards English language proficiency, graduation rates, and chronic absenteeism. In terms of school improvement, we look at identifying schools based on those performance indicators. So we have two sets of schools required to be identified under federal law, targeted support schools and comprehensive support schools. Targeted support schools are those with the consistently underperforming subgroups. And those schools, if you have that designation, have six years to improve and close that gap. Schools that have that designation are required to locally develop an improvement plan. That plan is then approved and monitored by the local school district. Comprehensive support schools, on the other hand, are the lowest performing Title I schools. They're high schools that have less than 67% of their students graduating, and they're targeted support schools that were not able to exit that status within six years. Any school with that comprehensive support school designation has to put together an improvement plan that is approved by the state. Now, ESSA has a number of reporting requirements. I've talked a bit about the accountability metrics. There's also all of these reporting requirements that we are required to post and have available for the public to view. One example of a new reporting requirement is cross-tabulation, where you can look at data from a number of perspectives so you can see relationships based on multiple factors. So for example, if you want to see graduation rates by race and income status. So what's next? We have uh, sent our state plan in to be approved by the U.S. Department of Education. Once we get notification that that plan is approved, we will be asking local school districts to also submit to us a plan, a local plan, for approval sometime in the spring of 2018. 
uh, local districts will be asked to provide assurances that they're going to be meeting the requirements in the law as part of that plan, as well as answering specific questions required in the law. I also want to note that in developing lo their local plan, local educational agencies or school districts are required to meaningfully consult with a number of stakeholders. We have a link, as you can see, for a full list of those stakeholders that are required to be consulted with under the law. Local educational agencies will need to assure to us that they have met these consultation requirements. Finally, there is a lot more to the state plan than these few pieces that I have discussed here today. There's a lot more detail around each of these pieces, and there's more uh, in regards to educator development and student supports that uh, you may want to learn about. So if you're looking for a complete review of our state plan, it's available on our website at www.dpi.wi.gov esea.